Good evening, everybody. Thank you for taking your time to join us tonight. Um, my name is Colin Granger Allen. I'm North Island Sales Manager for Affi Milk. Um, I've been uh, working with Affi Milk for now for 12 months, covering the North Island, and I combine my um, farm system skills with um, my farm knowledge to help farmers make decisions around technology um, with Affi Milk. Um, my role tonight is um, host, so I'm here to and manage timekeeping, introduce everybody, keep everybody on time, and also manage our Q&A at the end. So the agenda for this evening is, uh, is a presentation, a roughly 30 minute long presentation, um, and then we'll have 20 to 25 minutes um, at the end for, for questions and, and for you to ask some questions. So um, just, um, Please use the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. So you'll see a box at the bottom of the screen um, that uh, allows for Q&A. So please, this is your opportunity as the evening goes through and you listen to the presentation to ask questions. Um, so being a webinar, um, we will answer as many questions as we possibly can in that time at the end. Um, if we don't get around to answering all your questions, um, we, will, we can email an update at the end. Um, the meeting to webinar tonight will be recorded um, and it will also be live streamed on Facebook. So it will be available to watch on, on YouTube afterwards. So if you want to share it with friends and family afterwards and find it useful, you'll be able to do that. Um, I say um, I'm also being helped here by um, Jamri Hile, our South, South Island Sales Manager. Give us a wave, Jamri. She can look after all the South Island farmers that are cold tonight. Um, so um, yeah, she's she's up down there looking after us. I'm based here in Rotorua, um, the Central North Island, um, and um, yeah, covering covering the North Island for Affi Milk. Um, so like I said, the, the webinar will be recorded, um, and like I said we'll do our best to answer those questions at the very end, um, and uh, and answer all your questions. Um, so. If we run out of time, like I said, we will get back to you and cover those questions at the very end. Um, so without further ado, I'll introduce um, Bernadine Vanderberg. Um, she is our application support specialist and has worked for Affin Automation for 10 years in South Africa and here in New Zealand. She is a qualified vet and combines her veterinary knowledge with technology to get the most out of Affin Milk's care monitoring um, and other sensors that we have. She wears many hats with inside um, Affi Milk, but our farmers know her for her dedication and knowledge around Affi Milk products, and she supports our farmers to get the most out of our technology. Um, so sit back and over to you, Bernadine. Thanks, Colin. Okay, let's get this show on the road. Share my screen. Can we see that, Colin? Yes, yep, all good. Okay, great. Um, once again, thanks, Colin, um, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, welcome to our first Affi Milk New Zealand webinar. Um, we're really happy to host you. So when we think of cow monitoring or wearables, the first thought is usually around heat detection. But what these collars measure as well is what we traditionally didn't know about our cows, and that is how much time they spend eating and ruminating. However, with the daily variations in the diet of our pasture-based cows, this information can become quite overwhelming for the user. So the aim of this webinar is to provide you with the tools to use this data and improve the health and rumination of your cows. So just a quick overview, and I, for you to be able to interpret this information, you need to have an understanding of the behavior, how it's measured and what affects this. So essentially, I'll be dividing this webinar up into three parts. Firstly, looking at uh, rumination. So what is rumination, the physical process of rumination? Why is rumination important and also what affects it? We'll then move on to eating and why we measure eating as well, how this behavior differs from rumination and how the, our color distinguishes between the two. 
And then once we have that rumination and eating data, how do we apply it at a herd level by looking at group digestion and then also on an individual cow level? So moving on to rumination and what I like to call uh, rumination 101. So cows are ruminants and they have this amazing capability of converting plant material into energy through a very complex digestive system. So a ruminant has four stomachs. So first of all, we've got the rumen, then we've got the reticulum, the omasum and the abomasum. And if we follow the path of food with the first one is this green line. So the cow um, in this picture has a bite of pasture, goes into the rumen, gets a bit of a mix up in there and then goes into the reticulum. So here in the digestive system, the reticulum acts like a filter. So any particles that are too big to pass from the reticulum to the omasum gets regurgitated in a bolus form, goes back into the mouth and the cow chews that again. So that's why it's also called chewing the cud. She brings up that bolus, she chews it again, and that reduces, or the, the goal of that is to reduce the particle size. So when she swallows that food again, which is that little blue line that we take, if it's small enough, it passes from the reticulum to the omasum, then the abomasum, and into the rest of the digestive tract. So that is essentially the process or the, or the process of rumination. So moving on, why is rumination important? So rumination is an indicator of cow health. The rumen is a very sensitive ecosystem and it's made up of tens of millions of bugs. Um, it's a big fermentation chamber. And when we're feeding cows, we're essentially just feeding the microorganisms or the bugs within the rumen. And they digest that plant material, essentially creating the building blocks for milk production. So rumination helps to keep that population within the rumen balanced and healthy. It's part of the process of cow or, or keeping the cow healthy. So what happens when rumination drops? So we need to look at the factors affecting rumination. One of the main things of rumination is it produces heaps of saliva and that saliva has a buffer as it's a natural buffer um, that buffers the rumen content. So if rumination drops, there's a drop in saliva production and that then creates a risk of acidosis. So Dividing the factors affecting rumination into two. So first of all, there's the diet factors, diet factors and cow factors. So in the diet, we're looking at the feed components. So what is the diet formulated of? Fiber content especially, and not just fiber content, but particle size. So what we call, is that effective fiber? Does it have that scratch factor? So is it something that stimulates rumination? In other words, it sort of stops in that reticulum. So <clears throat> it's too big to pass through at the first go. So she needs to bring up that bolus, chew it again before it goes through. So that's, that's effective fiber. And then also rumen full. So the rumen full or how full the rumen is stimulates rumen movement and thus rumination as well. And then the cow factors. So an unhealthy cow or cow that is feeling unwell will not ruminate. Um, looking at her rumen environment um, or the individual's rumen environment. And then there's also an inherent variability uh, between individuals and between breeds. So those are all the factors or some of the main, main factors that, are, uh, that affect rumination. So moving on from there, let's look at eating. So different systems or cow monitoring systems record data differently. And some combine eating and rumination to give you feeding time. But these two behaviors are both quite different. So why, why do we measure eating? So first of all, eating helps when interpreting rumination behavior. For example, if we've got short eating times with long rumination time, it means that the 
feed quality or this poor quality, slowly fermentable feed that the cows are ingest ingesting. If we've got reasonably high eating time with really short rumination time, it means that there is inadequate effective fiber uh, in the diet with a risk of rumen dysfunction. And as I mentioned, probably the most common would be acidosis. So both scenarios are in, inefficient and it, this just illustrates the benefit of measuring eating separately. Secondly, using um, eating time, cows that eat more produce more. So if we have a look at daily eating time, we can optimize our routines to make sure that the cows spend the maximum amount out there um, eating, eating feed, um, which obviously translates into milk production for us. And then it's also an indicator of health. So some cows can go on ruminating even when uh, eating has decreased. So being able to measure eating um, is a great advantage. Uh, some lame cows, for, for example, may stop. Um, we may see a drop in uh, eating before we see a drop in rumination because they're not actively grazing anymore, but they may have a bit of a lie down and ruminate. Um, that's just one of the examples where, where we're looking at eating in isolation can, can alert us to a cow that's unwell. So let's look at the two different, um, the two uh, different behaviors. So on the left here, I have, uh, doo -doo -doo. sorry, let me just, because we have, if this will work for me. I knew it was going too well. Just give me a moment to sort out this drama. There we go. So on the left, we have some heifers um, on fodder beet on one of our farms down in the South Island, and she's ruminating. So, and on the right, we have uh, some cows also down on one of our farms in the South Island, happily grazing away. Uh, on some good looking pasture. So if we look at the heifer on the left, um, ruminating is a controlled movement. It's small grinding movements of the jaw. Her head is stationary, so there's not much movement. And it's whether they're lying down and ruminating or standing up and ruminating, that is sort of the pattern of that movement. There's a pattern to it. Whereas eating is a lot more of an aberrant movement. So she's her head is down, she has big movements of the head, she's sort of wrapping her tongue around that um, uh, blades of grass, sharing it with the bottom incisors, swallowing while she's while she's eating. So that's a it's a it's a lot more of an erratic movement compared to rumination. So there's there are big differences uh, in the behavior pattern. So from here, let's look at how our collars measure these cow behaviors. So let me just get my pointer back. So this is an AFI collar. And here at the bottom, we've got the weight that essentially keeps the business end of this in place. This is the sensor that sits here behind the ear in the upper half of the neck. And it's and a 3D accelerometer, which looks at head motion to classify the behavior pattern. So it's looking at or measuring acceleration of head movements in three dimensions. Dimensions. So we've got the up and down movement. We've got back, um, front and back, and left to right. So essentially, if we're keeping, I always think of it as a yo-yo. So. The more the movement, the more the acceleration. This is a small movement, so less of an acceleration. And then also it goes from side to side and front to back. So if you're keeping that, those videos that we've just seen in the back of your mind, that rumination is a very, very um, small patterned movement, whereas eating is a lot more aberrant. All right, so now that we've got um, the basics down, um, when we measure eating and rumination, let's have a look at how we can, first of all, apply that data at a herd level 
and then to the individual cow as well. So group digestion, we use this to monitor herd health. Um, rumination and eating can be an indicator for feed availability, feed quality and feed composition. So availability of uh, pasture, uh, have we fed out our silage? Have we fed out enough silage? Um, feed quality, are the cows going into a really stale paddock? Um, has our silage gone moldy? Um, feed composition, so if we think back to the factors that are affecting rumination, obviously if we've got a, our feed is composed of highly digestible carbohydrates, there's nothing that is stopping that feed from going directly through the reticulum, through those filters, nothing to stimulate rumination. And obviously, conversely, if we've got an adequate amount of effective fiber, there's that stimulation of the rumination process. Diet is, however, only one of the factors that affects rumination. We need to keep the environment in mind as well. So especially weather, um, the cow's routine, um, whether it is shifting paddocks, uh, feeding out on the feed pad, feeding within the parlor or um, on, on the paddocks or in the paddocks themselves, and then obviously season as well. So just keep that whole picture in mind when you're looking at eating and rumination on a herd level. So just some examples of um, the data that um, is shown within our software. Uh, what we see here is um, the daily eating and rumination minutes uh, on a herd level. The green line is eating, the purple line is rumination. So here on the y-axis, we've got average daily rumination time in minutes. And here at the bottom, we've got days. So counting back from this screenshot was taken on the 31st. Uh, of May, so counting backwards from then, so we can see the past six weeks for this particular group. Um, this is from a farm down in that farm down in the south with the um, with the fodder beet, um, and they do really well in transitioning their cows um, onto fodder beet. So they start them off um, as milk animals, gradually transitioning them uh, onto fodder beet, and then um, going through that same process during the dry period. However, what this graph is showing us that for this particular herd around 12 days ago, there was a small spike in eating with a bit of a drop in rumination, but then about a week ago, there was a really, really big um, jump in, in eating and, that, um, and it's a, a concurrent drop in rumination. So considering that this is a herd that's on fodder beat, this is a situation where we need to investigate what has gone wrong here. Has they, have they um, broken uh, through the fence? Um, have we done our cal calculations uh, incorrectly with what we're giving um, from on the fodder beat versus the um, roughage that we provide in addition to that? So yeah, here we can see the rumination dropping quite a bit. So the risk of acidosis on fodder beet is obviously quite high. Um, and then we have the eating dropping down after that too. For our next example, um, this is a farm in Taupo. Um, what we see here again is the uh, green line is eating, uh, the purple line is rumination, and this particular farm um, have our milk meters, our in shed milk metering technology as well. So this is their um, the average milk production uh, per cow for the whole group or the herd in blue down here. So just keeping in mind, this is sort of the milk production that we see late in lactation, so it is trending downwards. Um, this particular farmer um, was concerned uh, and was seeing a few clinical signs of acidosis in the, um, in the herd. So um, lots of watery feces, uh, low PAT score uh, in the paddocks. And the average rumination of that herd was sitting at about 250 minutes uh, per day. They decided to change the end shed or the formulation of the in-shed feed, and they added a bit of soybean hull. 
into that to sort of to um, bump up the dry matter intake in the herd and sort of post that change, the average rumination minutes per day of that specific herd went up between 30 to 60 minutes uh, per day on average. So that's on a group level um, what, what we, some, some of the applications of the rumination and eating information that the collars give us. Now looking at an individual or on an individual cow level, earlier in the presentation, we discussed dietary and cow factors that affect rumination. So let's use that logic when investigating any individual um, cow health alerts. So first of all, dietary factors. If you've got a high number of alerts um, on the individual health report, um, keep dietary changes in mind because it's, it's more often than not, it's something that happened at a group level as well. And you may see a group alert too. Try to work out what has changed. So was there a change in ration? So applying what we've just learned about rumination, what change in ration could have occurred to, um, for instance, cause a drop in rumination? Was there a severe weather event? Um, is there something that is limiting feed availability? So for example, in this graph we're seeing here at the bottom. So this graph is for an individual animal and it shows here on the y-axis rumination deviation the percentage deviation from her normal or her average. So the normal or average line is here, the zero line right here in the middle. Anything above is obviously a percentage increase from her average and anything below as a percentage decrease from her average. In this case, and here at the bottom, sorry, on the X, um, X axis, we've got hours. So any individual health alerts we are able to see eating and rumination deviation for each hour. So going back for the past two and a half days, more or less, we saw a, quite a bit of a drop in their eating um, from their norm. And these are empty cows that were dried off and were following the milk cows around. So they were essentially cleaning up paddocks as they went. Um, so there was a high number of these empty cows that were recently dried off on their health report. And this is the reason why. So mo more often than not, if, if a dietary change is responsible for a high number of alerts on your individual health report, they more often than not come right on their own after a few hours or a day or so. So that's dietary factors. Let's look at cow factors. So again, as I mentioned in, um, my introduction is we're essentially now able to see what we didn't traditionally didn't know or didn't know to look at, and that's eating and rumination time. And this also means that the collars more often than not um, detect disease or a cow feeling unwell at the subclinical level. So subclinical meaning that we don't necessarily see visual signs of illness when a cow alert or when it sorry when a collar alerts us to a specific problem cows are prey animals or have evolved as prey animals so they're genetically designed to mask signs of illness and that's where the collars can help us intervene um, at a really early uh, stage of that disease process because generally early intervention just means that there's a lot of rap or a um, more rapid recovery if we get in there quite early. So looking at cow factors, um, first of all, uh, look, at, look for, the, for the obvious um, and take things like stage of lactation into consideration. So obviously if we have a transition cow, so just prior to or just after calving, Look out for the um, for the obvious issues during that period uh, in their in their lactation. So milk fever, a retained fetal membrane, uh, ketosis, uh, underlying mastitis. You might need to do an RMT test for that. Um, 
have a look and see if there's a drop in just rumination or a drop in eating and rumination. How severe is the drop? Is there a severe drop or and how long has that cow suffered from a drop in eating and rumination? Um, take all of these factors into consideration when you get a cow on the health report um, to decide whether it warrants immediate investigation or treatment or um, sort of wait and see. Then once you've sort of gone through that, um, I call it the warrants of fitness for cows. So <laughs> it's essentially a systematic investigation. If all else if all else fails, a systematic investigation um, to try and find out if we have any idea of what could or what the potential problem could be. So first of all, um, sort of starting at the back and working our way to the front. So at the back, take the temperature, check if she has a fever or not. Um, going down, check the udder, um, check for subclinical mastitis. Uh, Further down, check all four feet. Perhaps there's something stuck in between her toes. And then moving forward, uh, have a look at um, the face. So are the eyes sunken? Are her ears droopy? Um, is she salivating excessively? Which may mean that there's something stuck in her mouth. Um, if we have a cow that has uh, just a drop in eating, uh, the first thing would be, so what is preventing that cow? Is there something preventing that, physically pre preventing that cow from eating, like a tooth abscess or some stick stuck somewhere in her mouth? Um, so we've, we've gone through, or uh, at the beginning, there was an explanation of these behaviors, how we measure them and what affects them. So use that knowledge when you're looking at an individual cow or on a group level to go, I know what, I know how these behaviors are measured. What could be the cause of the drop in either or? The beauty of the collars is also the ability to um, keep track of their response to treatment. So um, what we have here is a farm up in North Canterbury. Um, Again, an individual um, cow graph that has a rumination deviation on the y-axis, zero is her average, and we're looking for anything that's dropping below that average line, which indicates that there is a, a, a drop in her rumination and or eating. So purple, we're looking at rumination, green is eating. And we can see here, um, or at this point was when they, um, uh, diagnosed and treated her uh, for mastitis. So we got in there quite early. She still had a bit of a drop in her rumination and eating, but we can see subsequent improvement in both eating and rumination post that treatment. So keeping in mind that we have hours here at the bottom and not days, <laughs> so it, is, um, it is a really, really quick intervention and quick re recovery post-treatment. When we, um, again, looking at how these behaviors are measured, often cows have to be or feel clinically unwell for the collars or for there to be a change in rumination and eating behavior. So it's important to remember that the collars aren't a diagnostic tool. It measures behavior. It doesn't give you a diagnosis. Often things like subclinical mastitis um, <clears throat> or even clinical mastitis, if the cows are really healthy, the, inf the infection and inflammation remains localized to the udder. So a cow can be suffering from mastitis, which we may be able to diagnose uh, visually without there being a drop in eating and rumination. So when you're looking at, um, at the data and cows that you may have um, identified visually, but there hasn't been a change in eating and rumination, it's because the cows are not feeling systemically unwell or, or sick enough yet for there to be a drop in eating or rumination. 
All right. So that was a mouthful. Um, and I sort of powered through that. I hope a lot of that made sense. And I would just like to um, summarize in three points. So first of all, the colors are a tool. And as I said, it's a tool to measure behavior um, and it's not a diagnostic tool. Um, and the real value of it comes in when you're actually using the information. Then it's important to look at the whole picture. So consider all factors influencing rumination and eating when tackling a problem or a perceived problem. Um, and also look at your cows, they will tell you. Um, it's not an exact science, so it's important to use your observational skills as well. And then lastly, but, but most importantly, is figure out what works for your farm. So do not, sorry, that was, um, don't compare yourself to other farms and other systems. Um, different cow monitoring systems have different algorithms and how they measure eating and rumination if they do measure eating as well. Um, and don't try to reach some magical figure for rumination time because as we've, um, as we've learned, it's highly digestible. Oh, sorry, <laughs> highly digestible. It's highly dependent on diet. Um, so don't, don't try... Um, as I said, don't don't try and reach some magical rumination minute time per day. Um, consider people, finances and feed availability and make sure that the system is tailor made to suit your farm um, and your management practices. And that's what that's where um, application support. Um, that is what we do um, to make sure that it's it suits your need and you get the most out of out of the system that you've chosen to install. Right, I see Colin there. It means I'm over time. <laughs> so, so no. thank you. I think I think I, I did rather well. Um, uh, I went a bit off track a few times, um, but yeah, thanks. Thank you for listening, uh, and I hope um, that made sense. Thank you very much, Bernadine. No, you've done absolutely magnificently well managing your time. That was awesome, um, and I always learn something every time I listen to you. I always learn something. And, well, it's different um, than to what we had yesterday, so, <laughs> so I, I no, try to mix um, it up. <laughs> you have a wealth of information that's a real asset to Affymilk, so, so thank you, and that was excellent. We have got some questions in the, in the Q&A, so people have been posting away, and we'll go through as, <laughs> as many as I can. Choose the easy ones, please, Colin. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I will mix it up a little bit, just so I will start you off gently. Um, Kieran Good. has asked, um, good evening, Bernadine. You have mentioned earlier about effective fibre. Some people say longer chop size is sufficient fibre. Others say straw. Thoughts? Uh, <laughs> there wasn't an easier one, was it? I think that's the easy <laughs> one. You start me off with that one. <laughs> Thanks, Kieran. <laughs> I appreciate the question. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so it is uh, essentially effective fibre relates to, uh, you hit it on the head, it's, it's the length of the fiber particle that, um, is, uh, that is, determines whether it's effective or not. So obviously, the longer the particle, the less likely it'll go through that, uh, that filter, that reticulum filter, and that stimulates rumination. Obviously, there's a happy medium there, you can, you know, don't, go too long and or if it's obviously if it's if it's too short there isn't that stimulation of that rumination reflex but it's it's not just the the like uh, particle length it's also uh the um the solubility of um of that dry matter that you're using so straw has not soluble at all whereas if we're looking at something like silage um that's a lot more soluble so lengthening the or, or or increasing the length of your of your silage may not have as much an effect um because it's it's quite soluble as well uh whereas straw is not soluble at all 
um, and that will have that um, that stimulate that rumen rumen reflex. Yeah, I hope cool. that makes sense. That, <laughs> that does make sense. Thank you for thank you for that question, Karen. Um, Charles has asked a question here. Do you have a time budget consideration in the system, i.e., rumination, eating, milking, walking, etc.? So I think what what Charles meant there was, do we have a you know uh, an expected time for those those different mm. movements within the system so no no so not not within the system so there's nothing that will alert you if um you know if if you're not meeting a certain time budget we know um in general there are certain rules of thumb when it comes to um time spent eating time spent ruminating so healthy cow rumination between seven to eight hours a day um, and eating time more or less the same. Um, but there's nothing within our system that, that alerts you that you're over budget or, or under budget at sort of at more, it looks, um, any alerts in our system looks more towards any de or deviations from their average and how they're tracking and whether they're tracking down or whether they're sort of tracking up. Cool. Okay. That makes sense. Um, another question here, Kerry, and we've got some similar questions around, is there an ideal ratio or correlation between grazing and rumination? So we've got a kind of couple of questions sort of themed a little bit like that. Uh, so a, a correlation between grazing and rumination. Um, It's quite it's quite difficult to say because um, it's not just it's not just time spent grazing that affects rumination. It's more the quality of that pasture that will affect rumination. Obviously, if we've got really really um, fast growing short round length, you know, grass really pumping. Um, and in the, in the springtime, there's very little dry matter uh, in, this, in, that, in that pasture and, that, and very little to stimulate rumination. Whereas if we're going to sort of the end of the season when the round length gets a bit long and the paddocks become a bit stale, uh, we get longer rumination times on the same, on the same pasture. So it's very much, it's very variable um, within paddocks even uh, what that rumination time is. Um, and it's, it's more quality uh, rather than quantity that, that will affect rumination time on our grazing animals. And then also any supplementary feed um, that you feed mm. um, or that makes up part of the cow's diet. Cool, well, that makes sense. Um, Raywin's asked a question here around, is there, is there a rumination target per K? Or is it a change more of an indicator than absolute rumination rate? That makes sense. So, is it is there a target per k, or is it an, is it you know mm. a change indicator? I would say it's probably more uh, more a change indicator, with, uh, or a change indicator is more important than a specific target because mm. what we've seen in, in in our systems and on our farms. We have certain farms where cows happily ruminate at, uh, or the group ruminates at between 300 to 350 minutes uh, on average per day. And, and that is a happy as group um, on that farm for what they're feeding. Whereas other farms that feed a lot more intensively, their rumination, and, and what I say by intensively, they may, um, have feed or feed pads um, where they feed a mixture of roughage on the feed pad or have some in shed feeding. Those farms ruminate quite happily at between 500 and 600 minutes a day. So it's very much dependent on the farm system. And that's one of the points that I made in my summary slide is there's no there's no magical target. It's what is what is the normal and what is healthy and happy for your cows on your farms. Um, and then it's that it's the change that then indicates um, an issue that we may need to respond to. Yeah, cool. That makes sense. Yeah, it's, it's monitoring what that what the cow's normal is, and indicating yeah. outside that. Yeah. yeah, sure. No, that's cool. 
Um, Crispin's asked a question here. Bernadine, where does resting times fit and how can it be interpreted alongside adequate or inadequate feeding? Does it factor in? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Thank you, Crispin. Um, <laughs> yes. So, um, at the moment, our or our collars um, don't me measure rest. Um, that's sort of a, a function of uh, of our pedometers. Um, they 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 do a rest measure, measurement, but they don't measure eating and rumination. So, I mean, if we're looking at um, a cow's time budget, um, resting absolutely makes um, makes a huge difference. Um, we need the cows to rest. Um, because that's when they're actually um, sort of shutting down and, and making time for, for, um, for milk production and that fermentation chamber is, is sort of pumping away. Um, so yeah, it's within a cow's 24 hour time budget, we need to, we need to allow for time uh, for them for time to rest. Um, currently with the collars, we cannot measure that resting time. Um, but if we take all the other factors into consideration, we know we're given the amount of time that they or minutes they spend eating with the minutes they spend ruminating. We know how long we milk them for um, in a day. Um, so those <laughs> poor cows have very full days. Um, and yeah, resting needs to, 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 to function in there as well. Cool. No, that makes sense. I hope that answers Crispin's question. Um, this is a good farm management kind of question or a management question around interpretation of the information that we get from wearables. Um, Lucy's asked a question. Um, we are getting alerts from about 20 cows each night. How do you know if we need to go and check the cow immediately, i.e. milk fever, acidosis, or is it okay to leave it till the morning to check on those cows? Um... Yeah, that is the um, that is a very good question, and I think that's probably um, where where a lot of farmers do become overwhelmed uh, with the with the eating and rumination information. And I think it's um, it's very much dependent on stage of lactation. Uh, we have that uh, that sort of that cow during the transition period, which is just before calving to just post calving which is a very critical period and where cows are obviously a lot more prone to, to metabolic issues, milk fever, um, difficulty in calving. So during that period of the, of, of the year, um, one would be a lot more sort of reactive uh, to, those, to those alerts. Um, whereas, you know, once the cows are past that main, main danger period, um, it becomes um, it becomes a question of um, what's the sorry my English is running out at this, at this after this I've I've reached my English quota. Um, I'll try and extract it from from looking at you. I'll try to <laughs> read your mind. I mean, you, you gain you gain um, experience. It's experience. It's experience mm. in the system. So. When you pass that danger period, if you remember that slide where I said looking at cow factors, then it becomes a question of how severe that drop in eating or rumination is and, and, the, and the duration of that drop. Um, and generally, the further on in the lactation, we look more towards cows that have both a drop in eating or rumination and eating uh, rather than just looking at those sort of in isolation. And also consider, like, if you're getting loads of alerts, um, if they're all in the same herd or in the same mob, um, think of well, what might be happening within that mob. What has happened to that um, to that group of animals to cause this to cause this drop? Um, and through that sort of process of elimination, you can decide whether is is this something I re need to react to immediately, or can it? Um, wait until the following morning so i guess it's understanding what's happening on farm you're always getting the information yeah. but it's really important to know what's happening on farm yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you look know, at all the go, factors yeah sure yeah it's not, you don't sort of look at one thing and make a decision you kind of you're looking mm -hmm. at everything yeah sure that makes sense 
Cool. We're, we're getting through the questions nice and quickly. Um, Matt has asked, do the collars monitor cow temperature? No. Uh, no, they don't. That, that's a good question. Um, no, the, the collars do not measure temperature. So where that sensor is located, that's a that's there, there's no way to get an accurate uh, measurement of of core body temperature or even just a deviation from from the group average where that sensor is located. So no, we don't measure temperature. Cool. No, that makes sense. Um, Andrew's asked a question, and you this might be a difficult one to ask. How much milk production on average are you saying per lameness event? If you've got a, I think this is a hard one. Per lameness really event? Yes. So that, that, <laughs> that one I do not have off the top of my head. <laughs> um, <laughs> there will most likely have been some, um, uh, some research done around that. And as Colin said, um, after this webinar, uh, you'll be receiving a recording of the webinar plus um, sort of a, a Q and A will do the questions and have the answers, and I'll probably be a lot more eloquent when I'm sitting down and have time to think of it. And I'll also have a bit of a look um, and see. But there will definitely be research done um, around a lameness and the um, drop in milk production around a lameness event. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, that's cool. Um, George has asked, is there any science on optimum eating and rumination times in minutes per day that we should be aiming for? Um, again, it's um, yeah, yes, yes and no. Um, and I think I, I, I answered this a bit um, in a previous question. I think it was Raymond that asked, you know, is there are we are we aiming for a target or are we looking at deviation? And I think this is sort of my answer to this is going to be along the same lines. So first of all, different systems, um, cow monitoring systems uh, measure eating and rumination differently. They've got different algorithms to, uh, to, to, to calculate rumination and uh, eating minutes on a daily level. Um, so it's, uh, I won't recommend comparing rumination times between different systems. Uh, and I also, um, as I said, it's it's very much, especially uh, on a New Zealand pasture-based system, you it's it's risky to compare it to other farms because if you've got a system two farm, I mean there are very few system one farms left. If you've got a system two farm that sort of is predominantly pasture and have very little bought in feed or additional or supplements that they feed. As I said, those cows can be happy and healthy and ruminating away at 350 minutes per day on average. Whereas you've got a system five um, farm like Kieran's <laughs> where there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of um, supplementary feed going into those cows. Um, and they are happily ruminating at 550 minutes. So we know that if there's a drop in that, yes, it's it's a, it's a definite problem. So it's it's more around that deviation from their average um, rather than aiming for a specific target. Cool. Well, that makes sense. I hope that answers um, answers the question there for you, George. Um, Ruben's asked a really good question. How much does rumination and eating change when cows are dry? And is this deviation from their normal still the best indicator of health? Great question for this time of year. Uh, yes, it is a great question. Um, and it's also um, during dry, the same factors that sort of affect rumination during the mill period or milking period will also affect the rumination then. So uh, very much around uh, their diet and, and what they're being fed. Um, we do, however, um, I mean, during the milk or when a cow is in milk, she's obviously a lot more efficient at converting that um, into milk production, whereas rumination or, or rumination during the dry period of rumination and eating, we want her converting that into sort of maintenance uh, of her condition during the dry period. So we would not want to see a lot of movement 
and rumination from a cow that was while she was milking to when she goes into um, into the dry period, we'd want to um, have that remain as stable as possible. And there's yeah, there's and there are also some um, um, not reports. What's that other thing that they write? Articles. Uh, <laughs> there are also some articles being written around looking at um, rumination time, sort of um, five to six weeks prior to calving, uh, and how that affects their recovery uh, immediately post calving. So do not forget about or neglect your dry cows. We need to um, keep that rumination and eating um, up during the dry period as well. No, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you, Bernadine, for answering that question. Um, we've got a couple of questions. We've got a couple of comments that people have made um, more than anything, um, but I think we've answered pretty much everybody's questions um, unless anybody's got anything last last minute to ask um i mean i've got some questions that i often get asked um you know you know will i get alerted if my cows are on fodder beat and they're uh, overeating you know that's often a question that farmers ask me when i'm talking to them um you know is that something that uh, you've seen yeah, yeah, yeah. So absolutely. So um, just thinking on uh, back to that graph um, that I showed uh, when we spoke about group digestion and the farmer got alerted to that group that had that spike in eating with a subsequent drop in rumination. So again, fodder beet, obviously, when you get to that bulb, um, an extremely or highly digestible carbohydrate, there's nothing stimulating rumination in that in, um, in that forage. So um, as soon as they overeat on fodder beet, we get that uh, drop in rumination. Um, and, and that's where, again, if we, if we remember that one of the main functions of rumination is production of saliva, which then acts as a buffer. So following on from that if we've got a massive drop in rumination we have a risk of acidosis uh so yes it does um you do get you get, do get an alert and you will see the cows that are worst affected on uh on the individual health um health report as well so you'll get heaps of alerts if you've if you, um <laughs> if you've got a problem um on your fodder beat cool That's, we've got time for one quick last question one does just um, asked a question right at the last minute here. Does the system recognize an event like calving? Is her due date in the system and somewhere around that date a chance that a change in behavior appears gives an alarm that the calving has started? Good question. Yes, uh, good question. Uh, no, we do not have a calving alert. Um, we have um, we have a user report that um, looks at uh, due calving. So it looks at uh, cows due to calve uh, based on obviously her um, PD data and when she was inseminated. And the, generally, in general, the behavior during um, that calving event is we see an increase in activity. We see a drop in rumination. Uh, and often, if if we remember how a collar, um, how our collar measures uh, eating, which is obviously an extremely aberrant movement, so it's that big movement of the head. So often, what we see during a calving event is increase in activity. We may see at that little rise in her eating, which is just irregular head movement and we see a drop in rumination. And sort of if we see those three together, close to her time, um, uh, to close to her time of calving, that gives us an indicator that that cow uh, either has calved or is potentially going to calve really soon. Yeah, but not calv calving alerts as such to say, you know, this is a calving event that's happening right now um, you need to go and have you need to go and have a look <laughs> and and see yes. 
but it, it it looks at everything around that calving event and say calving is either imminent or it has happened. Um, so yeah. Cool. Well, thank you very much, Bernadine. I think we're we're just about running out of time now and within our hour. So um, you've done extremely well answering the questions. I know it's not easy. <laughs> Um, no. when you put on when you put on the spot and you do not you're flying yeah. blind you do not know the questions yes. are coming and there were some very specific questions there yes uh, it was very it was very good questions and i and i'm looking forward to sitting back <laughs> and reading them and then having like a, a really good thought process behind my answers so you you'll probably um, in the emails you'll get the answer may vary vary a bit like i said i'll probably be a bit more eloquent um, in my um, delivery. If we haven't answered your question, um, please feel free to contact us. So our contact details um, will be uh, at the end of the end of the webinar. We also have a survey. So it's really important for us to understand and get some feedback from this evening. Um, you guys have been great um, asking questions. What would you like? Uh, what have you liked? What, what would you like to see in the future? But also some of the topics you'd like us to cover in the future. Um, and that gives us a really clear idea and um, what we can cover that we've got uh, experts in our team that can cover all sorts of things so um, we're more than happy to do this again um, I'd like to thank you all for your time and um, how you kept warm out there um, on this cold chill evening and um, certainly um, thank you very much for your time Bernadine thank you again thank you Jan Marie for being my wingman down in the South Island um and but um, particularly thank you everybody for for joining us so um again thank you very much and uh, don't forget to do the survey at the end so thank you all we'll catch you again next time thank you very much thanks for joining us <laughs>